Welcome to the OC, bitches. Welcome. Season four, episode yes. 12, The Groundhog Day. And today's guest is Gary Grubbs. Listen, I'm so happy to see this face. A veteran character actor since 1977, Gary has amassed 178 acting credits and counting. No, notable films include JFK, Ray, Django Unchained. Those are all Oscar nominated, by the way. And some yes. of the most memorable TV characters, um, like on Growing Pains, he played Leo DiCaprio's long lost father, I George did. Brower. Yeah. On Will and Grace, he was Harlan Park, Will's number one client. And this is just to name a few. But you all know him as a lovable billionaire, Gordon Bullitt. Bang. <laughs> okay. So Bang. please welcome Carrie Grubbs. Thank you. Thank you. Bang. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> you know, I say, uh, I say this thing. You know, you, you come to work and you see these people going to work and you don't know them. And you two ladies would come to work and you're just waking up and just get going. And I think, oh, they're pretty nice looking. And the minute they put on their makeup, they fix their hair. Then they put on a screen, they put on a wardrobe. And then I see them on camera and go, wow, how beautiful. How great is that? So it just goes, it goes from ordinary to extreme. So I say you should be the OC dogs, not the OC oh. Oh, OC right dogs. I'm changing the name of the show. I've been here three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take it. <laughs> well, you know, you bring up a really good point because it's I, I've always I used to say that, you know, I would I'm too lazy to be Julie Cooper in real life. It's not what we look like when we walk in the trailer in the morning. Right. I don't, yeah. I do say I think one of the keys to getting older is finding your light. You don't look good in every light. <laughs> 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 as as we are doing this here, but okay. So (laughs) we want to catch up with you, you know, and also because, you know, we've never got, that's one of the great things about doing this. We get to catch up and then have these conversations that, that we never really had when we were working together. Although you and I did have a lot of off-screen talk about, you know, parenting and and my daughter was very young at the time. And we, you know, I had a lot of, a lot of um, fond memories of chatting with you, but tell us how you became an actor. Good. I don't know. Um, (laughs) It was, it was pretty simple. I played football at the University of Southern Mississippi. My college roommate would go over to the theater department and try out for plays, but he said, don't tell the fellow football players. They'll think I'm a sissy. So he tried out for years, never got anything. So I graduate. I become a bulldozer salesman. He, got, he slips off to Hollywood. Next thing I look up, and he's on Little House on the Prairie. There's, there's my, I heard his voice. There's my college roommate. And then, uh, and then he says, "Guess what? I'm I'm doing Police Woman next week with Angie Dickinson." I says, "Sit tight. I'm on the way." <laughs> so I go to L.A. I go to an acting class. I go to the set of uh, Police Woman. I watch Angie Dickinson. I go, "Shoot, that beats work. That's what I'm going to do." <laughs> so Simple as home. that. <laughs> that was it. I was married to a Miss Mississippi who had already been on television, who had already already recorded. So it wasn't strange to her. So, I mean, we sold the dog, the, the horse, the barn. We sold everything. And six weeks later, we were in L.A., oh, which wow. was which was crazy, but not crazy. It's how people do. So that's how, that's how I ended up there. But you also, um, you were a writer as well. You primarily thought you were going to be a writer, but ended up. That's where I started. And that's where I am right now. Are you? Oh, yeah. I, I, very little. I live in Mississippi. You're looking at Mississippi. I also have a game show. What? Called, the, called The Search is On, and we're pitching mm-hmm. it right now. We pitched it to all the networks. We're about to pitch it to Australia and, and the U.K. And it's, you know, when you search in a search bar and put, how do I, and about five things drop down, mm-hmm. that is your search. Those five things that drop down, which one was first, which one was second, which one was last, which one mm-hmm. did I make up? And it's a really fun game show. So, you know, you still, the survey says, instead of the search bar now says, so the search is on. We thought we sold it like three times, but we're still going. We're going to sell it. Get ready for the search is on. Do you want to host? <laughs> sure. I, I would love to. <laughs> okay. The dollars. <laughs> the doll is here. <laughs> and I have one that I've just finished the deck on today called the Jersey Devil, which is a, a myth that goes on in the New Jersey woods since the 1700s. And it really is a script that I'm going to sing. Okay. And it's, not, and it's not a horror script. It's an action fun. It's an action fun romantic script. But it's called the Jersey Devil. Well, there's a reason I wanted to talk to you. There today. you go. Not yeah. just yeah. interviews. Yeah. You're getting jobs. I mean, this is just a really productive day. We got Gary. Well, 
got the scripts. podcast <laughs> is coming to an end. We're running out of episodes. Yeah, I need something to do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the uh, and I had one called uh, a Dolly Parton movie for Netflix last year. I was going to ask you about that because it's based on your play as the crow yes. flies, but the, that was very girl. successful from yes. 1999, and it's been redone many, many times, right? But now and, it's and that play still playing all over the country, right? And and that, uh, but then I made a screenplay in, into it for Dolly Park. So here we go. And she That's did, you. She, she did that. So I'm still busy out here. bullet, busy <laughs> bullet. I, yeah, I'm a bullet, and I and I teach. I teach every Wednesday night. So I'm in Gulfport, New Orleans, and Mobile. I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. I have another question here. So in your opinion, like, how has the industry changed since you're still so in it? I don't know, but it has changed, hasn't it? Yeah. I'm so in it, I'm so out of it. And the reason I'm out of it is because I live here. So I don't talk to people like you every day at the coffee shop. Mm -hmm. The people I talk to talk in a different world. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the reasons I do acting class. It keeps me inserted into the business. Mm. It keeps me talking about the business and the people who are trying to be in the business or in the business. And I also get to do some acting every week, whether, you know. And uh, so it really has changed. And it's, it, I think it's more difficult than it was. But I don't know that. We'll see. I'm headed out, out that way in a few weeks and, and to try to sell property. But I know this. As a screenwriter, you better be in town. You mm. better not be in, in the hinterlands. Because, As an actor, we can be almost anywhere now, though. Right. As a screenwriter, you think you still need to be in L.A. Well, they want those meetings in town. They mm -hmm. want you to come to their office. So anyway, so uh, still writing, still doing some acting and teaching. So I'm bouncing around. I bet your acting class is fun. Yeah. Just like it you is, are. It's a self-help group. <laughs> right. It's, well, that's that's what acting class is, is break you yeah. down so that they get to build yeah. you back up yeah. and figure out what's going there, on with there, you. Right. There are people down here that live in the conservative South that they can't say a cuss word or they can't kiss somebody or they can't get mad or they, they go to acting class. They go crazy. Oh, <laughs> like they have a permission <laughs> because, to do to live another yeah, life. They're the character. It's not them. Mm -hmm, so right. they, they can. They can get as angry as they want to. They can say bad words. Can, <laughs> That's the only got, scenes they pick. <laughs> yeah. I got one girl. I go, you cannot slap the other actor that hard. <laughs> oh. <laughs> she, she gets so real into it, you know. Anyway. They're working out some stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Working it out. So that's part of that. So tell us, how did you end up on the OC? I was out there. And my agent said, uh, you know what the OC is? I said, I've seen a little bit of one of those. And he said, there's a part. Do you want to uh, audition? I go, heck yeah, why not? He said, it's a number of episodes. I said, I can be here. So uh, I went out. I came out and got in the room. And there's Gerald McCraney and Bo Bridges and all of these well-known actors. Did you know that? No. No. These and are I, who you were auditioning against? Tom Selleck. What? Yes. And I'm reading this is for the great. part. I'm reading for the part in it going. I can't get this part. How can I get this part with these, you know, with these people? So everybody in goes in and does it. And I said, no, it's a comedy. I'm doing the comedy part. They were playing it straight. Mm. So I come uh -huh. in and I go, hello, I'm Gordon Bullitt. And that's with a bang. Nobody else had said that. And they just picked it up. Oh, you improv bang. Yes. Oh. Well, I have Want to improv bang? They picked it up, and it just became my character, part of the show, part of a dialogue, part of your dialogue. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And just kept going. That's amazing. Okay, could you imagine Tom Selleck? First of all, I guess I'm surprised he was auditioning, but but that would be a right. And Bo Bridges, and that's yeah. a totally different. And because season four is so comedic, and this episode, you know, you cannot take anything in this episode seriously. It right. all has to be comedy, but and, well, and it has to come from that character that that's believable like that. Well, the heads up to you guys, because there was a lot of. So I hadn't watched it a long time, didn't watch some of it when I did it. So I turn it in on there and I'm watching it. And some of it is really silly, unbelievable. But y'all played it straight. Y'all played it believable or it, the thing would have fallen apart. But <laughs> the actors decided it was real. It was serious. You know what I mean? Me yeah. getting married. I mean, because you're you're trying to figure out which two 
guys you're going to marry that were in prison together as roommates. <laughs> <laughs> you never commented or acted like that was a bad thing, and it, and it was. And, well, because it's like when we look at, you know, we've been watching all these episodes from season one to season four. Rachel had never seen, had never watched the whole show through. And she's like, well, right. Like, <laughs> yeah. what's what yeah. show are we in right now? Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I did this. I watched a few episodes. I was going to find my episode and I couldn't. So, you know where I came in? I came in on the episode where Ryan and Taylor have fallen off of somewhere. Oh, oh that's the that's the, Chris it's the alternate, Chris alternate yeah, world. Right. That, that. And so they're dreaming. So it's yeah. a whole different world. Yeah. So when I walk in, you're standing at the bottom of the stairs and Peter Gallagher comes down and kisses you and gets in a car and leaves. You're confused. Yeah. And I start watching more and more and more, and I go, heck, I've lost my mind. I don't remember any of this. Because <laughs> I'm watching a dream, but I don't know I'm watching a dream. Right. When did this happen? <laughs> yeah, yeah, when did this happen? And when it finally got to the end, I thought, oh, thank God. You know? <laughs> Because the, the way that was, I wasn't even with you. I mean, I didn't know what I was even doing in the show. But I, it, think, it I think that's why that show. episode was so fun because it was such a, you know, a departure. derailment, departure from what we were doing, which is such a grind. It can be a grind doing nine, ten months out of the year of right. doing the same character. But then we get to play with our with our thespians. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So that, but when I was watching that, I thought, oh, no, I don't remember anything correctly. And I didn't I didn't know Chris Pratt was on that show. Oh, I had yeah, no yeah. idea until I saw the tape. You know, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You guys saving, saving the world, you environmentalists. Oh, yes. Doing big things. <laughs> right. Pratt and I. <laughs> Want to smell better? Naked? Let's face it. Our underarms aren't the only place we have odor. That's why I'm excited to tell you about Lumi Whole Body Deodorant for pits, privates, and beyond. Lumi was created by an OBGYN who discovered and proved in clinical testing that the vagina is not to blame for day-to-day -day odor below the belt. So she developed Lumi, a uniquely formulated pH-balanced deodorant. It's aluminum-free, skin-safe, and clinically proven to control odor for up to 72 hours. So I'm, I'm very curious about this. And I mean, I'm going to give it a try. How about you, Melinda? <laughs> well, okay. This this is such a unique deodorant because I love that it stops BO from happening in the first place and it doesn't just cover it up. And also it does it all with no aluminum. Lumi is not just for women too. It's for men and teenagers. And I really wish that I'd had it when I was a teenager. Lumi's starter pack is perfect for new customers. It comes with a solid stick deodorant, cream tube deodorant, two free products of your choice, like mini body wash and deodorant wipes and free shipping. As a special offer for listeners, new customers get $5 off a Lumi starter pack with code OC at lumideodorant.com. That equates to over 40% off your starter pack when you visit lumideodorant.com and use code OC. Do you remember, like, do you have any memories of being on set or other than obviously the audition memory is crazy. We had no idea. But do you have any memories that come to you when you were shooting the show? Like your impression of your first day or what the set was like? See, when I got on there, I had just pulled up just enough tape to see one episode. And I wasn't sure. I know in the audition room, they love me being over the top. And I'm thinking, okay, do I want to be more me or do I want to be the crazy guy? Mm -hmm. And when I got there, immediately the director goes, no, no, no. He's, he carries me the crazy way. Over the top, loud, boisterous, out of control, you know, arrogant, but in a fun way. Mm -hmm. Never get mad. Never understand the word no. I don't know how many times you call me an idiot, a fool, a buffoon. And you would say it, and I take it as a compliment. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? And yeah. it took me it took me the first show to figure out, okay, I see who I am. And even when I watched it the other day, I went, good gracious, I was big. Good right. gracious. Yeah. It because worked you guys, so well, though. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it was a good mix. It's what it happened to be. It was a good mix into you guys being so serious. Mm -hmm. And you guys had to be serious because some of your material was crazy. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, the Groundhog Day and stealing the Groundhog was oh, all crazy. Yeah. He played it so serious and it worked so well. Yeah. No, we're not. We If you start going through with like, why did they do this and that and the continuity? There's so many little plot holes, but we are 
past all of, you know, the show always was a part of, it was comedy and tragedy, but we're really just comedy right now. And right. there's a lot of joy. There's not a lot of villain. There's not a lot of conflict. Right. The conflict is, is good natured. It's not malicious. And I think that's what Gordon Bullitt was. He's not malicious, even though he no. kind of, you know, he, he could rub people the wrong way, but he's just not malicious. Right. He was obnoxious. He wasn't malicious. <laughs> no, he, he, was I to hurt everybody. he was just trying to buy and make everybody happy That's yeah what i yeah. couldn't believe like in this episode when you're trying to get her to marry you and you're like there's no prenup after you mentioned 900 million and like and there's right. no prenup and i was like whoa <laughs> and you know what i when i said and there'll be no prenup and she goes that's very generous generous <laughs> She said that twice when I said, I want to, I want to marry you. And you go, well, that's very generous. <laughs> I, thought, I thought that was the weirdest word they picked for you to say. <laughs> well, it's an it's, it's a, that, that, That's not very, you know, loving or sexy or interesting. It's generous that I want to marry you <laughs> and because I have so much money. You know, it's, it's a really fun, it's, it's such a fun storyline because, you know, you came in with a bang and clearly even though Julie was a little turned off for some reason, she found something kind of endearing and kept giving him these little chances, but apparently he's gone off to Dubai. Now he's, now he's back because Caitlin, we yes. find out has been emailing and which was the, one of the cutest, funniest scenes with the, with the ward twins say, tell him, I tell him I like your butt. And they said, butt like a dozen times, right. <laughs> which is so childish. And then and he, I started slapping you on the butt. Yeah. You, you did that in a couple episodes before <laughs> right. too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. uh, but no, we, we actually had the conversation with our director, Michael Lang, where he was like, he, he smacked you on the butt. And I'm like, no, if you look close, he didn't actually connect. He did it just so. And, and cause we were discussing about things that you can get away with nowadays. And I'm like, no, no, no right. it's fully, fully in character for him to do that. Right. I always thought, but, um, yeah. but, yeah. but he comes home gangbusters because he wants to propose with a big, huge yeah. emerald cut rock. Right. <laughs> and I remember this day of shooting this scene where you drop on the knee and Julie, like literally as soon as, soon as you drop, she drops her purse and yes. it's like, Oh my gosh, what? We haven't even seen each other to come to figure out that. Right. In, in a month. And, yeah. and, and I went to Dubai and I ended up speaking. Probably we couldn't speak today. You know, I call somebody and I'll, I'll kind of wacko. I, start, I, I say all kinds of terms that I think, you know, I don't know if we could say that, you know, 15 years later. Yeah. You know what I mean? We right. were making, I was making fun of Dubai, Iranians, or Iraqis. I was making fun of everybody. <laughs> yeah. was, what did you call? <laughs> you called Sandy a Hebrew. Oh. <laughs> and you, Sandy you called him. A hebro instead of yeah, like a bro, like Hebrew yeah, he and bro, <laughs> Hebrew, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hebrew, yeah. There's so yeah. many okay. things with your character, like the PC, you know, was definitely right. out the window back then. Oh yeah. my god, <laughs> did you get? Do you get? Um, do you get recognized for Bullet, or did you at the time? Well, it's really strange. People who recognize me for Bullet are OC fans. They know the OC, they know the character, they know the name, and they've been watching it. It's not often, but when I get them, it's complete. They want to talk about it. They know about it. They know the episodes. They, you know, you know, they know your character names. They know Summer Roberts. They know Julie Cooper. I mean, they know. And uh, mostly, I get recognized. Guys, you don't know this, but or maybe you do. I've played serious lawyers yes. in the J JFK. And I don't know how many features where I was a serious lawyer, and I was on Lifetime so much as a lawyer because they were doing su Southern shows, and I would play the real lawyer from the Southern show mm -hmm. to. To one night, this will kill you. I'm on. I'm on the air on a Lifetime show playing a lawyer. They cut to an advertisement for the next Lifetime movie, and it cuts from my face to my face, and I'm a different character in the next movie. Guess what? <laughs> I never did Lifetime again. I had been on there too much. You yeah. see, it was like he's on every Lifetime movie. <laughs> he's a lawyer on every movie, yeah. and I would play these people who were mostly from the South and they'd had problems, you know, and I played their lawyer. And so lifetime at Hallmark, when it first started, I was all over. Yeah. But then features, I mean, uh, and then I had a pretty good career career. I'll say, because I could do comedy and drama. A lot of guys can't, a lot of guys that do that heavy lawyer, even country wild mean stuff. Can I do comedy? Mm -hmm. But I mean, I, you know, I did the golden girls and I, I was Leonardo's dad, daddy. I, I throw the pot on Three's company yeah. in, his, in his face. So, I mean, I just, I did all of those. 
Yep. I, Golden yeah. Girls. I mean, my God, that for yes. me is like, yes, the ultimate. Right. Do you, do you have a favorite? Because those, those, um, you know, four camera comedies are so much fun in the way they shoot compared to single camera shooting. Do you have a favorite? I guess, I, you know, I did the first year of Will and Grace. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was, and I came on as a guest star. I mean, y'all have seen this happen. And the guy was playing the role. And the day before we shot it, they said, he's not funny enough. Mm-hmm. He's not going to be here tomorrow, which I know they're letting him go. And you're going to do his part. I was so upset that I'm doing the guy's part, but it was such a funny part. And I thought the whole time he was doing it, I could make that work. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I did it as a guest star. And after the guest star, the show went to upfronts where they mm-hmm. look at the shows and whatever. And everybody in New York laughed so much. They called me back and I became a regular. Oh, but I, I went, on the sh- went on the show as a guest star. Yeah, yeah that, we know how that so is. That, <laughs> that's the one that people, that's the one that people know me the most of. Yeah. Yes. It must have been so fun to be on the inception of that show because yes. it's such a favorite and that chemistry between everyone was so wonderful. Right. Yeah. But but this show, you guys, I, I'm telling you, every stink, every stinking, every one of you would take some situations, something I thought that's silly as heck and you would play it so serious and all of a sudden it wasn't serious and it was believable. Mm. Sometimes the writing was down the, down the road and you'd put it right back in the road all the <laughs> right. time. Well, I yeah. think that's, I mean, for me maybe for you as well, Rachel, but I had not done comedy and this was dramedy and yes. this show, it was such a luxury to get to do something that was growing and changing um, from the very, from the pilot to what it became. Mm-hmm. And you felt like you were part of a workshop all the time or going to theater camp or school every, every day that we got to kind of explore because, and then, and then, and it taught me so much about exactly what you're saying is that if you play comedy for comedy, mm-hmm. it doesn't, re- it's not funny, but if you play right. it with real. some truth and realness in it, it does land correctly. Yeah. Is that what you teach? <laughs> could I be no. a teacher? <laughs> no, but I should have recorded that so I could show it to tonight. <laughs> this is what Melinda Cooper says. <laughs> Melinda Cooper. Yeah. No, right. but that's it. That, that's, that's exactly right. You had to play it for real. Right. You sure did. You know, the other thing that I love is your relationship or Bullet's relationship with Caitlin, I think is so Mm. sweet. And I, oh yeah, I'm just rooting for it the whole time. And I just thought it was the sweetest thing ever. Well, I would have had no chance with Julie Cooper if it hadn't been Caitlin doing her. I want a daddy. Why not a rich daddy? Why not a fun daddy? I like this daddy. He likes you, mama. She just kept selling me. It's the only way I stayed in the game. (laughs) And meanwhile, she's off off hanging out with my prison roommate. <laughs> well, I know. Okay. So, but let, I mean, I think this is a different, she's changed so much because in season one, she leaves Jimmy, Jimmy for Caleb who ends up being bankrupt. And because she went and ended up in a trailer park, that trailer, I think taught her so much because I think she would have instantly, um, the gold digger in her would have instantly said yes to a proposal. And now she's been through so much. She's lost her daughter. She's been humbled by life. She's not trying to, you know, she's literally leading with her heart and she has some real feelings because I think if the old Julie would have said yes in a heartbeat. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. So, so, but yes, she but does. See, I didn't get there to the fourth episode. So all the first three don't count. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I know it doesn't matter until <laughs> Bullet shows up. And, uh, and I think the fourth episode, they were taking more chances and being a little wilder. Oh, yeah. Were, yeah. Because they knew uh, the show was coming to an end. So the yeah. writers said, we're just going to have fun with this. So, yeah. But, and they but, did. Well, and so <laughs> that very funny proposal, very awkward proposal happened. And, She's so upset with Caitlin and, you know, cause Caitlin sounds like, she's like, what, you just like him for his money. And cause Julie assumes that's what it was. She is a mini Julie. But then when she says, no, I like him as a stepdad that tugs at her heart. Right. And, and so when she shows up to that party and she says, I have to say no, but I, Baby. but Maybe because we don't know each other that well, Mm -hmm. but maybe I can grow to love you. How mature, honest, and transparent is she? That's like, I wish I could be like that in a situation where I'm like, and and Bullet's like, okay, I'll hang on. It it doesn't hurt his ego. He's like, 
because apparently he's been married well, five times. It was times. hard to hurt his ego, I can tell you that. <laughs> it didn't exist, right? Yeah, and you you said, maybe if I get to know you, and maybe if I get to like you, and maybe if I get to love you, then, then I could be your wife. Well, what do I do? The next scene, I hand you some flowers and go, here's to my wife. I just project forward constantly. Oh, yeah. You know, it was not like I'm waiting <laughs> When you said, maybe you're my wife, I go, here's my wife, the next thing. <laughs> when people are calling me, my my husband to, to today, my husband, he used to call me wife before. And I'm like, we're not married yet. You're, <laughs> you know, and so on the day, I'm like, now you can call me wife. You're like, slow your roll. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but no, I, I think you make a really good point that there are people out there that, that just live life. They're not reacting to life. They're actually living it. Right. And I think yeah. Gordon's just living it for the joy yeah. and uncertainty of it, where some right. people are always scared of what's going to happen. And he's married five times. We're going to find out that, wait, he yeah. has like 12 boys yeah. or something. 12 sons. Yeah. <laughs> 12 sons. Named after every city that he um, procreated. Every in, in. Yeah, every city. And in, in, they were all Texas cities. Well, one was Hanoi at the very end. Yeah, at the end, at Hanoi. <laughs> right. So I was overseas playing around a little bit. Apparently, apparently. Yeah. You know, it was a mystery who Julie was hanging out with, but then it's revealed that it's Frank, and he's he has a ring, too. Right. So it's like, wait a second. I feel like this is, at, at first I was like, this is so quick. Frank does say it's a promise ring. Right, right. And it, the storylines are coming to an end, so we're accelerating, yeah. like, yeah. What's going to happen? You ready for this? What? We, I did a movie called Let There Be Light. You know who did that movie? Who? Hmm. Writer, director, producer, star, Kevin Sorbo. Oh. So he you... calls me to do the movie, and I get down there, and I go, I, no, I'm not doing that line. You got Julie Cooper. I did. I'm not changing that line. <laughs> <laughs> and we were... It was pretty heavy. It was political and religious. And I was one preacher and he was another preacher. And we were going two different right ways. But he but he called me because of the show. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. Not, they said, we, we need somebody a little older who can go head up with Kevin. And he said, I know the guy. We don't have to audition. I know uh-huh. the guy. So oh, he great. called me at home. I didn't audition. I just showed up in Dallas and we did the show, did this movie. Oh, my right. goodness. That he directed, right? So if you really don't have anything to do, nothing to do, <laughs> watch Let There Be Life. <laughs> Let there be light. I, you know, I wonder how long it would take me to go on a Gary Grubbs marathon because, <sighs> you know, it was like I looked and it was like 170, 175, 178 credits. I mean, it's like you know, you, one should be so lucky in this industry to even to even well, continue and, to do that. Right? And I had worked, I had worked in ten years to amount to anything. Mm. I've been writing, and I've been here and taking care of family, and I'm in Mississippi. Yeah, so. And then COVID, I was kind of working again, and COVID kind of shut everything down. Mm-hmm, so, yeah. so we'll see from here what happens. It's a slow recovery. It feels like it is. Yeah, it? yeah. No, just like I'm ready to go. Oh no, the world shut down. So, yeah, no, there, is no, there is no go yet. Yeah, yeah. No. Yeah. One of the things you know, before we have to say goodbye to you, before we have a couple questions for you too. But your passion and your joy for your work, I mean, it really shows. It shows on screen. Number one. And I think it was really, I think season four had, we had some great guest stars that really helped elevate us going through the end of a, of a series. I mean, do you have advice for others doing the same? Like, how do you keep your passion through such a tough industry? <laughs> well, you, you, you have to do it job by job. And what you have to do is find the best you can out of that character and out of that job. And then afterwards, you're really happy. Because if you don't, if you halfway do it and you halfway energy it and you don't give it your best, you look at it and you go, oh, because you can build on it. And then the more you do it, the more you build on it. And then it more excites people. My deal, and I'm sure y'all have to do this too, thank goodness for the cell phone photo. Because here, I can't go to the grocery store without taking photos of people. Mm. I can't go anywhere because I'm the only actor within 200 miles. So everywhere I go, and it's because they know me. I don't sign autographs anymore. I take photos. Huh. And that's great. They'll come up and say, I know you, so and so and so and so. And I said, yes, good to see you here. Let's take, let's take a picture together. <laughs> they take the self selfie. And then I'm going, enjoy that. Good to see you, man. Once they get the photo, they go show it to somebody else. Once they get the selfie, yeah. they, move, they move along with it. So you can do that. If, I'm sure it happens to you too also. But when you get out in the middle in LA, they don't do it, but you get out around yeah. here, they do it. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, people always think LA is like, you know, is people don't really come up to you in LA. Right. Now, you know what they Actually, do here? Yeah. All right. 170 shows and they will come up and they will call you by your character name mm-hmm. from the show. And then they will start doing the dialogue on the show and want you to answer the dialogue. Oh, oh my <laughs> gosh. All the time. And, you, <laughs> and they'll say it and I'll go, okay, what's my line? And they'll do your line. I go, okay, here we go. And I'll do two or three lines. And I say, give me the lines. And they know the lines. Oh, and some awesome. people will find the show that they like and watch it 10 times. They know the dialogue. And especially on some of those action shows, those tough shows, mm-hmm. you know. I put, the, I put the sunglasses on Jamie Foxx in the Ray Charles story. Mm. Oh, I have people who want me to put the sunglasses on. <gasps> <laughs> but you do it with pleasure and a smile. Yeah. That's the, yeah. that's, that's yeah. the, it's the attitude. I mean, I yeah. think everything is just a, is a choice. That's your yeah. attitude is a choice, right? Yeah. If I go to the grocery store or Home Depot, I go early in the morning. Right. Oh my gosh, that's what you're too big of a star, Gary. Well, we have a couple um, fan questions. Put them on. I'll take a photo of them. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Rachel and Mindy. This is Saul from the UK. I'm a huge fan of the podcast. Love what you guys do, and um, it is one of the highlights of my week, as I'm sure many other listeners have said. My question is for Gary, and very simply, are you Team Frank or Team Bullet? Take care, guys. <laughs> oh, we know that I am Team Bullet. Of course. Of <laughs> bang. Course. Uh, team Frank, bang. No, <laughs> I'm the bullet. And, and Frank, Frank, uh, Frank wouldn't let me say bang in his, in his Christian movie. He would never do it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> did you improv a lot do you, on the OC? I felt like you did a little bit at the ends, like buttoning up scenes. Well, I, not a lot. I can't, but every now and then I could end the scene like uh, mm-hmm. when I say that I'm going to make love to you and I said, and we're going to go back and I'm going to take you down to Chinatown. Oh, you did say that. That's crazy. Yes, you that's, did. That's from, that's from my high school. <laughs> when, a guy, when a guy was going to make love to a girl, he says, I'm going to take her down to Chinatown. Ooh, Where yeah. it came from, I don't know, but that's what the saying was. Oh, that's you know? amazing. So, so, so lines like that. And damn am, I'd say so and so. Yeah, damn am. <laughs> and that my uncle used to say that. So yeah, I, I threw a few in there. Not quite so because it, that you couldn't. That show was written tightly and moving forward. Mm-hmm. And the next, the next scene would play off of that scene. Would play off of that dialogue. So sometimes I did, yeah, not much. Right. right, very good. It's your biggest fan, Josephina Toma, <laughs> saying a howdy, partner. How's Juju doing? And a bang. <laughs> and bang to you. She's just checking in, wasn't she? Okay. Do you know her? Well, I know a Josephine who's a friend of one of my class members, and I thought that's who that was. So, but anyway. so how you doing, Bullet? <laughs> What's cute. going on? Yeah. <laughs> you know, the show had a, uh, because it was done by jo- Josh Schwartz and it had Jewish elements, I was really, yeah. I was really, it was really interesting that they played that so open. Usually they don't. It was mm-hmm. so part of the show, and they played it, played it well, it made it work, it wasn't offensive. It was not like, look at us. We are the rich Jewish family from the OC. Mm -hmm. So my question is, how in the heck did I get to Orange County? Does anybody know? All of a sudden, I'm there. And Frank is there. And my son is there teaching tennis. (laughs) I mean, it's one of those things I... I could see, yes, the the wealthy money, the wealthy billionaire ends up doing some dealings in Newport, Newport. Beach, being a very wealthy thing too. You've got some kind yeah. of he's all over in the wealthy wealthy places because it was yeah. we were we were riding high in the early two thousands. Right, everyone, yes. yeah, yeah. The OC, what? Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. it was it was a word before it was the show. Yeah, you know yeah. I mean? yeah. I, I meant financially, the world too was doing right. like a me yeah, up. Before right. 2008. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it's really just personally so genuinely, I'm so happy um, that we reconnected. So yeah. I hope to see yeah. you in the future. Gary, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us. Seriously, your character, Bullet, was so much fun to watch. I really just loved it. I loved what you did with the character. And it was so nice talking to you today. So thanks for taking oh. the time. You're very welcome, Rachel. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, Call thank you, Gary. We'll do it again. We got plenty of more we can do. Let me oh, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Absolutely. Sure. Okay. <laughs> have, Take care. Have a nice day. You All too. Right. You too. Bye bye.
That was so much fun seeing Gary Grubbs. Gary Grubbs. Well, you know, so this so this episode, Mindy, uh, ground, the Groundhog episode, Seth and Che get in some trouble with the police when Che drags Seth into helping him try to free a groundhog before Newport's annual Groundhog Day Festival. Meanwhile, Kirsten gets some life-altering news, and Taylor gets some extra help from a therapist to make things different with Ryan. That is the synopsis. It was written by Mark Fish, directed by Ian Toynton, original air date January 25th, 2007. Like we were saying, it's a wacky fun episode. Poor little Taylor. She's up there stalking her boyfriend. Yes. <laughs> which stalking isn't really funny, but for some reason it's funny in this episode. <laughs> funny in this I, episode. Yes. I can I just say something? I've never seen Brody more over it than this episode. <laughs> Like, yeah. his delivery, his improv, like, everything he's throwing out there, I was like, oh, he's so done here. Like, I keep saying it as the we get closer to the end, but in this right. one in particular. Yeah. Do you no, agree? No, I mean, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. No, there's, well, we, we talked about it last week with Patrick Norris. Yeah. And that's what we're saying. There's some wacky, super wacky stuff going on. And I, I think <clears throat> if you look at these episodes trying to figure out why these characters are doing this, you're going to make yourself frustrated. Right. This is now a different elevated suspension of disbelief. And th this is the writers. Um, like, it's almost like you have what JJ and John Stevens said. You could see how much fun they were having in the mm -hmm. writer's room. Mm -hmm. And this was like, okay, let's do this great storyline. First of all, we didn't do Valentine's Day this year. So they, because it's been done. So now we're going to do Groundhog's Day. Right. And, and the funny part about it is, because I looked this up, I'm like, do we do Groundhog's Day, uh, Groundhog Day in Newport? California? Oh. Because Summer even goes, it's funny because it, one of the big things is that Groundhog Day we has don't have to do winter. with like winter <laughs> shadows, all that kind of stuff. It doesn't necessarily make sense. And even Summer says it. She's like, because it's kind of weird that we have it here because, you know, we're sun, sunny yeah. all day. You know, yeah. all all year round. There's no winter. But yeah, no, I don't think that they do that. But I think the writers are in on it. And then they thought this is just this whole thing is this very fun, wacky thing. And uh, yeah. 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 I mean, the whole episode, just watching like everything, you know, uh, it was enjoyable for sure. And the Brody stuff was just killing me. Even like when he's like, when he and Che, are, uh, I forget where they are, but they're talking about, oh, let's, we'll go get snow cones. And he's like, my favorite's cherry and my dad's favorite is blueberry like he just throws out this like mindless improv that has nothing yeah. like it's just I, that's all I could really pay attention to to be honest. I mean well yeah Chris Pratt at his best committing you know he's still like you know when we were talking about Julie actually getting that phone call from Frank or we don't know we don't know it's Frank but you hear this like oh, noise in the background his and chanting. she's like it's it's Summer's weird friend but then you know he takes off to go when he takes off to see Seth, he so rudely wakes up Seth. Like I, anybody waking you up in your bedroom when you're just like, that is rude, right? I, I don't know. I mean, but, um, sure. but yeah, so he's got him going on this like mission to save Newport Chuck. Yep. And of course this, it's fun. I think it's fun. You know, the Mission Impossible and just the whole- The Mission thing. Impossible was funny. How they're like his whole- <laughs> Like, why'd you do plan. that? Because I wanted to do it, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And yes. they end up taking him, but they get stuck on the roof. They get, stuck and they out, they get locked down. out on the roof and then they get caught and then they're in jail. Because the man got me, Summer. The man. That made me laugh out yeah, loud. Yeah, the man. <laughs> and then we learn he's about to reveal to Seth that he believes that Seth is his soulmate because of the dream when they were basically on ayahuasca. But then, Could you imagine if he did that, though? Like, what? if I was curious if he was, like, because I couldn't remember what happened. Like, if the writers said, had Che tell Seth you're my soulmate. I was like, I almost wanted him to do that. Yeah. And then they didn't. They didn't because it turns out to be that he was, what, mixing up otters and groundhogs. Well, yes. It, it's funny because Seth is like, otter? What about the otter? Like, he keeps like saying. And then he wanted to know. Right? Yeah. But then he sees the groundhog and the girl who freed the groundhog who got arrested. Or I guess I freed the groundhog. But the girl in the costume, who's beautiful. Shows She's up so and it's cute. instant yeah. soulmates right there. Che yeah. found his groundhog. It's not an otter. Similar yeah. fur, not the same thing. 
Yeah, I felt kind of left out that he didn't actually say you're my soulmate. But I, th- that's when I was like, they were like, we can't go down that. We we'll have to write more about it. And then, right. This, and I guess this is the last time we see Che. Like he gets packed up and is moves it the on. last time we see him? It I seems believe like so. it because there's only I, a few episodes yeah, left the, at this point. There's only three. We're coming to the end, Rach. Yeah. I know. But, but, um, yeah, so there was, you know, Summer very reluctantly ended up doing this, but but the whole thing was just, you know, it was so fun to see little the sidestep of the ch- of the groundhog and yeah. taking off with with Newport Chuck and right. I, I I'm assuming that you know you switched switched your costumes and she gets arrested. Yes, and it's all, you know, like I said, it, it's not serious. It's not. It's serious. not serious. But I am sad, Chris. Well, let's just all give a little shout out to Chris Pratt because it's his last episode and Thanks, we Chris love Pratt. Che and Chris Pratt. I hope you go on to do big things. Yeah, I really hope. That, I really hope um, people can see the talent that we saw yes. in you and, and really helped helped you in, in your career. <laughs> so the other <laughs> thing I wanted to talk about was Kirsten's turning 40. That is a big deal, right? I turned 40 during the pandemic. So like all these big plans, whatever. And then we just had fried chicken and played board games at the house with like a few friends. But you know what? That's me in a nutshell. And I'm okay with it. But Kirsten turning 40, there's a lot going on, clearly. I forgot about this too. Right. And, and you know, she's, she's turning 40, but Sandy assumes that's why she's acting a little off, mm-hmm. but she's not even thinking about that, you no. know? And um, although I do have to say just personally, I used to remember... It's just, it makes me laugh now, but I remember when we started the show, I did the pilot 33 and I would do the math. I'm like, God, I'm going to be 38 when the show ends. (laughs) That is so old. I mean, it's still that kind of child mentality of like being 30 is old, being 38 is old. And it's like, my life is going to be over. (laughs) And it's just, it's a funny, it It is fun. That was me. uh, (laughs) Well, yeah, this industry, we keep trying to stay young and I'm just at a point now where I'm like, gravity's taking hold. I'm thrilled. Lines are fine. Yeah. No, it's all good. But yeah, Yeah. you know. So he's, he instantly says to the boys, like, she must be, you know, she's turning 40. That's a big deal, which is kind of, you know, he totally misses the mark, but she turns out she's concerned and she has to go to the doctor Mm -hmm. and doesn't know. And then of course we find out, you know, the doctor ends up having to tell her in person. Yeah. And I kept thinking, why not just get a pregnancy test? But then I realized. She didn't think, she didn't have any idea that she might be pregnant. Right. She didn't think she could get pregnant. So that's plausible. But this whole time we were concerned that she was going to be sick, sick. Like Sandy's face. She's like, he says, are you sick? And she's like, just in the morning. So, oh my God. But no, but that's kind of exciting. Although it is interesting. Like I actually, I had a, um, when I was like 44, I thought I was pregnant. Because well, I weren't? was, you were no, I just I missed a per- my period for a while. Yeah, <laughs> more more the beginning of perimenopause. Right, like, I was like, holy moly, I'm gonna do this. Like it, I mean, it that just was my thought. With your head. That was my thought yeah. because she has a a child, a child. Well, Seth is out of high school, like college age, and to do it all over again, I was thinking about how crazy that would be, having an adult child and then having another one. That's pretty right. That's well, a, and they insane. yeah, they didn't discuss. They're about I to mean, be she, empty nesters, and now. I know. Right. It's like, do, what do you, she didn't discuss. She wasn't thinking she obviously instantly wants to keep it. Mm-hmm. It's not, that was not even a discussion. Right. Of the alternative. Right. You know? Right. So. Right. But in the meantime, um, Sandy's like on this mission. We have no idea what the mission is. No. And I mean, I knew. Get this even though I didn't track. know, I knew. <laughs> oh, did you? Yeah. But then I thought, what are they going to do with this thing? And again, because I guess they lived in it. Yeah. Berkeley. I didn't realize that. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine? No. Like, do they actually lived in the thing? Yeah. Just he wanted reminds to me of get an air mattress. Yeah, it reminds me of Adam and I being on the river. I can <laughs> live in a. I love you so much. I can live in a tent with you. And he's like, Yeah, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Happy he shut it down. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Yes. We like our home. But yeah, but, so he's having this big party for her, the surprise party. And <laughs> one other favorite part was when Sandy gets Seth out of jail. <laughs> and his delivery is like, hi, dad, hope I'm not too late for mom's party. Like his he, delivery. He totally. I, yeah. He was like, hope I'm not late for mom's party. Oh, my God. <laughs> that was my, my favorite takeaway. Yeah. No, and so there's was, a party and they tell the boys, I mean, you know, telling about your pregnancy this early, but they're adults. I guess they can handle it. Um, right. Right. Yeah. And so the news is out. 
Everyone's at the party. That and that that is actually um, you know when when Julie kind of steps out and she sees how how happy everyone is. Yeah, and that's when she goes over to Bullet and it's like, yeah, you know what? I will give this a shot. Mm-hmm. I'll give it a chance. Yeah, I love my hair here. Yeah, you I look just great. Was like the, the welcome to it, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but no, welcome to like clip-in extensions. Oh. So I was like, where did those go? But that's <laughs> not my hair. Yeah. But can we talk about the craziest part of this episode? What? Is this whole storyline with Taylor and Ryan and her going Stalking to this therapist. Him. Oh my God. And there's no therapist I know that would like drive with you in the seat over to mm-hmm. the ex-boyfriends to give the thing. like <laughs> Right. But it was a fascinating. Okay, so she goes to this therapist after you know the the you know she's been stalking and stuff. But she actually is this aware person who says, you know, I've this person is a a, a specialist in emotional addiction, and she starts talking about how she's got this little stalker problem. And as she says it, and she's like, oh my god, I'm a I'm a oh my gosh, I'm a lunatic. Mm-hmm. And it, she does sound like a lunatic because mm-hmm. that's kind of odd behavior, but. She's there. She's trying to get a hold of it. And uh, have you ever like followed a boyfriend or anything? I waited no, for but a boyfriend I, no. once in high school. You did? No. No, but I've had a friend who followed and stalked me and my other friends, like like car chase style, like followed us oh. to a club to find out where we were going out. <laughs> right. Right. Now, I remember in high school, I was like, what? Okay, I'm waiting for the phone call. We're supposed to do something. And I'm like, well, I'm just going to drive down there and wait for him to come out. And I don't know why. but anyway, Did he ever come was, out? That was, <laughs> yeah, and then he went off. And did We're not together. Put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> but but she's, you know, she's trying to stay away from Ryan. And it is, a but taking space is a very healthy, smart thing to do. But mm-hmm. she happens to find the most and yes, the writers are in on this where this where this, this therapist says, my methods are very extreme. And for oh, the right. sake of this, doing this funny storyline with this crazy um, uh, therapist. Oh, right. by the way, the, the actress, Alison LaPlaca, she's been in some of the cool, she was Joanna in, in Friends. She's been in some- Oh my growing, God. Yeah. Yeah, that's why she was familiar. Okay. Yeah. She's been in some of the, my, I used to just love her when I was in my twenties because mm-hmm. she always played some, did some really cool um, roles in, but we get this, I mean, Taylor wants to break the cycle. So she lets this happen. But this whole thing about um, her handing over his stuff that mm-hmm. she's keeping toothpicks, she's keeping um, odd mementos yes. that she wants to deliver to Ryan, not things that Ryan gave her, but things that she's kept. Mm-hmm. And and it's a cute scene. Like, I think it's sweet that that Ryan's still actually saying, Taylor, you don't have to do this. We'll work on this. Right. He's accepting her weirdness mm-hmm. and her oddities. And she still is, you know. Yes. I mean, the scene worked. It was cute. It was. It's very sweet. I like them a lot. But then when she dresses up in the groundhog outfit and. Oh, my God. And she falls. <laughs> like, the and whole thing. <gasps> yeah. <gasps> you see Ben's head, like, look around. And. Yes, obviously that would be. It's kind of creepy, but I felt so bad and embarrassed for her I know. as she fell down. I know. <laughs> I know. But I'm loving it. It's very fun to watch. It's just so weird. <laughs> well, then it pays off at the end because when he when Ryan finally walks, he calls her and he imitates a, a breathing heavy breather. Yeah. And he's like, she's like, that is the most romantic thing anyone's done. I don't think she's saying that seriously. She's now joking about it. And she's saying, well, I think she's she's like, that's the most, I guess it's two, but then he's, but now they're going to, it's forgiven. You happen to be this way. He just thinks it's funny. And I think Mm -hmm. a lot of us take things a little too seriously in life. Like, is she really, I mean, he's, he's into her scrapbook that he, that she made him. Right. Which was kind of a fun little thing. Like Ryan's change. Everyone's changing. Yeah. Don't recognize these people, but that's yeah, good. I know. Yeah. Everyone's yeah. changing. And I'm looking forward to the next episode. I laughed I laughed out loud a lot on this one. Yeah. There was a lot. <laughs> Daryl. Daryl's back. We got to give Daryl a shout out. Who do I call? <laughs> yeah, who do I call? Got to love Daryl popping up. Um, but that's the episode. Uh, that is the episode. It was yeah. great to see Gary. It was great to see Gary. So happy he came on. 
And that I never knew he invented Bang for his character. That was pretty. I know. That's a big one. That's a big and one. That Tom Selleck. I mean. Or Bo and Bridges. Bo Bridges. I got to ask Josh about bullet? this. I have questions. <laughs> you mean, yeah. I mean, things that people, this is why we have people on so they can give us their yeah. experience. <laughs> yeah, that's so crazy. But um, anyway, thank you so much for listening. Follow, rate, and review. Welcome to the OC Bitches, wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you'd like to watch us, check it out on YouTube. And you can now listen to bonus features as well as season one and season two of the OC Bitches by going to castmedia.com slash cast plus. That's cast with a K, media.com slash cast plus. Bye, bitches. Welcome to the OC Bitches is brought to you by Cast Media. Executive produced by Colin Thompson, Harris Lane, produced by Katie Kurtwright, edited by Parker Flores and our technical engineers, Travis Holden and Dustin Park.